Hello, welcome to Hidden History and Odyssey Through Time. I'm your host, John Rodriguez, and welcome to Season 3 of the Best History Podcast in New York State. This is Episode 25 of the podcast, and the title of this episode is Lady in the Navy, The Extraordinary Life of Joy Bright Hancock. The first women to serve in the U.S. Navy were nurses, beginning with the Sacred 20 appointed after Congress established the Navy Nurse Corps on May 13, 1908. While this provided service opportunities for the trained nurses, the Navy Nurse Corps was small and nurses held no military rank. In fact, the Nurse Corps remained a separate unit outside the regular U.S. Navy. The first large-scale enlistment of women into the Navy occurred in 1917, when the United States entered World War I. Women were accepted into the Naval Reserve and would carry out administrative operations, which freed up able-bodied men to serve aboard ships. The new enlisted women were able to become yeomen, electricians, radio operators, or any other ratings necessary to the Naval District operations. The majority became yeomen and were designated as Yeoman F for female yeomen. None of the female yeomen were officers and none had a chance to pursue a career in the regular Navy. During World War II, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Public Law 689, creating the Navy's Women Reserve Program on July 30, 1942, which paved the way for officer and enlisted women to enter the U.S. Navy. After World War II, approximately 86,000 women served in the U.S. Navy as nurses or in the waves under the provisions of the Naval Reserve Act of 1938. In 1947, the Army-Navy Nurses Act established the Nurse Corps as Permanent Staff Corps of the Navy and Army, granting nurses permanent commission rank. On June 12, 1948, President Harry Truman signed the Women's Armed Services Integration Act into law. The law granted women the right to serve as permanent members of the armed services. The number of women who could serve was capped at 2% of all personnel and prohibited their full participation in combat units and combat aircraft. Despite its limitations, this act established the right for women to serve their country and perpetuity. One Navy woman who managed to serve during the First and Second World Wars while bluntly questioning the wisdom of barring American women from naval careers was Joy Bright Hancock, a New Jersey girl with an innovative attitude. It was this innovative attitude that pushed Joy to pursue her main goal of securing a permanent place for women in the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Armed Forces in general. Joy's story, hidden history that has remained long forgotten, is the story of an American woman determined to serve her country and a nation not yet ready to permanently embrace women in the armed forces. Joy Bright was born in Wildwood, New Jersey on May 4, 1898 to William and Priscilla Bright. At the time of her birth, Joy already had two older sisters and she later wrote in her autobiography that she was named Joy because her father had been disappointed when she was not a boy. To quote Joy's father, We called her Joy because she came to teach the meaning of that name. She is a girl, she's not a boy, and best of all, she is my Joy. William Bright was a real estate and insurance agent who would go on to help develop the resort areas of the New Jersey coast. Involved in regional and state politics and business, Mr. Bright was, at times, tax collector, city clerk, commissioner of deeds, Cape May County Sheriff, mayor of Wildwood, and director of the Marine National Bank. Now that's an impressive resume and one that would impact Joy's childhood in a positive way. Growing up, Joy was a happy and healthy child who had a good upbringing. Even after the births of three brothers later on, Joy would be the one who cut the grass and did the gardening. Joy's paternal grandfather lived with the family and taught her how to do many practical tasks in various fields, skills that were usually passed on to the males of the family. Grandpa Bright was an expert carpenter, and before she was a teenager, Joy knew how to handle tools properly and could paint anything from houses to bicycles. Joy also gained practical office experience by helping in her father's real estate and insurance firm. When she was only 14 years old in the summer of 1912, 
Joy's father gave her his vote of confidence by leaving her in charge of the office while he and his wife attended political conventions in Chicago. Along with the skills she learned from her grandfather and father, Joy was also familiar with skills often associated with women, such as sewing, cooking, cleaning. Her social life was centered around church and school. On Sundays, the Bright family attended three services, and when it came to education, Joy excelled at history and English literature and did not enjoy math class at all. After high school, Joy took a secretarial course at the Pierce School of Business Administration in Philadelphia. Before her business career got underway, however, the United States entered World War I in April 1917, and Joy saw an opportunity to serve her country. In July 1914, World War I, also known as the Great War, began after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria a month before. His murder catapulted into a war across Europe that lasted until November 1918. During the four-year conflict, Germany, Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire, also known as the Central Powers, fought against Great Britain, France, Russia, Italy, Romania, Canada, and Japan, the Allied Powers. On April 6, 1917, the United States declared war on the German Empire, joining the Allied Powers. By the time the U.S. got involved in World War I, the population of whole nations had dedicated themselves to winning the war. Millions of men were growing ever more proficient at using new technologies to kill each other. Thanks to new military technologies and the horrors of trench warfare, World War I saw unprecedented levels of carnage and destruction. By the time the war was over and the Allied powers had won, close to 20 million people, soldiers and civilians alike, were dead. In 1917, Joy was attending the Pierce School of Business Administration in Philadelphia when she decided she wanted to serve her country and enlist in the U.S. Navy. During World War I, Joy was a Yeoman F first class on duty at the New York Shipbuilding Corporation in Camden, New Jersey. In the Navy, a Yeoman was an enlisted service member who performed administrative and clerical work. Women were designated as Yeoman F for female Yeoman. Assigned to the superintending constructor's office, one of her duties was to carry papers and plans to naval ships being built at the yard. When she wasn't on duty, Joy spent her time with other Yeoman F who were assigned to sell Liberty Bonds in theaters and she also participated in Liberty Bond parades. Liberty Bonds were war bonds issued in four installments in 1917-1918 as a means to finance the U.S. participation in World War I and the Allied war effort in Europe. Liberty bonds were sold to the general population and became a symbol of patriotic duty in the United States, a way that normal citizens could contribute to the war effort from home. By the end of the war, the Navy decided to order women to duty near their homes if possible, and so Joy was ordered to report to the U.S. Naval Air Station in Cape May, New Jersey, 10 minutes by car from her home in Wildwood. By then, Joy had risen to the rank of Chief Yeoman and worked as a sonographer on naval courts and boards. World War I came to an end in November 1918, and almost a year later, in September 1919, Joy was mustered out of the U.S. Naval Reserve Force and worked as a civilian employee at the Naval Air Station in Lakehurst, New Jersey. In the fall of 1919, Joy met Lieutenant Charles G. Little of the U.S. Navy when he was assigned as the executive officer of the Naval Air Station in Cape May. Sparks flew fast and the two decided to get married once Lieutenant Little returned to the United States from England. Little had been assigned to the crew of the Navy's first rigged airship, which the United States had purchased from England with the promise that the British would train the American crew to fly it. Once Lieutenant Little reached England, however, it was determined that he would be overseas for more than a year. So in September 1920, after voting in the presidential election for the first time, Joy sailed to England with her mother and sister Eloise. On October 9, 1920, 
22 year old Joy Bright married Lieutenant Charles G. Little in Yorkshire, England inside a romantic 12th century church. The couple then spent their honeymoon in London and Paris before returning to Yorkshire to rent a living space while Lieutenant Little was stationed in England learning to fly the Navy airship. While living in England, Joy learned how to play golf and was introduced to the English national pastime of hiking and bicycling. She quickly entered into the local social life, which revolved around the church, the community, and the U.S. naval family scattered throughout the English country countryside. When money and time allowed, Joy and her new husband Charles made trips to London for a weekend of dancing, theater, and hot baths. The time was quickly arriving for Lieutenant Little and the rest of the crew to fly the airship ZR-2 from England to the United States, and so Joy returned to the States in June 1921 to rent a house near the Naval Air Station in Lakehurst, New Jersey, buy a car, and wait for her husband to arrive safely with the others. Two months later, on August 24, 1921, Lieutenant Charles G. Little was killed when the airship ZR-2 was destroyed by a structural failure while in flight over the city of Hull, England and crashed. Lieutenant Little was one of 16 American servicemen who lost their lives in the disaster. After the death of Charles, although she felt pain, Joy welcomed the return to the United States and the slow renewal of the desire to do something. In March 1922, she began work as the civilian head of the editorial and research section of the Bureau of Aeronautics in the Navy Department in Washington, D.C. However, because her deep interest remained in the field of lighter-than-air operations, Joy requested a transfer to the Naval Air Station in Lakehurst in August 1923. A month later, in September 1923, Joy left her job at the Air Station in Lakehurst. In June 1924, Joy married Lewis Hancock Jr., a World War I veteran and active member of the U.S. Navy who she had met while working at the Air Station in Lakehurst. The couple had a quiet wedding at the home of Joy's parents in Wildwood and Joy accepted her new role as a Navy wife. She would only have a year and three months to adapt to this new role, however, because on September 3, 1925, Lieutenant Commander Lewis Hancock Jr. was killed in the destruction of the Navy airship USS Shenandoah ZR-1 during a test flight over Ohio. Once again, 27-year-old Joy was a widow. After the death of her second husband in 1925, Joy became very ill and spent nearly a year in the hospital while doctors tried to locate an infection which had caused paralysis. After being discharged, Joy was healthy enough to take a cruise around the world with her sister Eloise. The sisters traveled through Asia and then on to Europe, where they left the cruise and ended up in Paris, determined to learn French. They enrolled in the Paris branch of the New York School of Fine Arts, where Joy received a degree. Before the sisters had arrived in Paris, they had stopped in Egypt to visit Joy's old Navy friend, who introduced her to another naval officer named Lieutenant Ralph Ofsty. Joy and Ralph spent three fun days together before going their separate ways, but Joy would run into Ralph again many years later, and it, and it would be a very happy reunion. But we'll get to that later on in the story. Now let's get back to Joy in Paris. Her experiences with foreign travel made Joy decide to try for a career in the U.S. State Department. In 1924, the U.S. Foreign Service Agency was created with the merger of the United States Diplomatic and Consular Services. Women were eligible to apply, and so Joy returned to the United States and enrolled in the Crawford School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. While attending the Crawford School, Joy took flying lessons. Not because it was the smart thing to do in the 1920s, but because she was afraid of anything that flew and wanted to conquer her fear. Although she had lost two husbands in aviation accidents, a majority of Joy's friends were involved in aviation, and commercial flights were fast becoming the new and accepted means of transportation. Joy would go on to receive a private pilot's license and conquer her fear of all things that flew. After two years at the Crawford School and passing two written exams but failing the oral examinations, 
Joy requested reinstatement in the Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics, where she worked at briefly in 1922. She was placed in charge of the Bureau's General Information Section, a position that allowed her freedom to exercise imagination and judgment. Being in touch daily with the various news media representatives made this one of the most interesting periods of Joy's working life. When Joy had worked for the Bureau in 1922, she was the first editor of a publication called Newsletter. Now that she was back at the Bureau as head of general information, Joy had the power to help Newsletter grow and eventually become the monthly magazine Naval Aviation News, which is still in circulation today. Joy remained with the Bureau's general information section for three years, but sometime between 1930 and 1933, she grew restless and wanted to explore something different. So she quit her job, purchased, purchased a round-the-ticket round-the-world ticket and left the United States. After a trip around the world that included stops in Asia and an extensive stay in Europe, Joy returned to Washington, D.C., and in March 1934, she summoned the courage to ask for reinstatement in the Bureau of Aeronautics. Her request was granted, and between March 1934 until 1942, Joy was the, was the civilian head of the editorial research section of the Navy Bureau of Aeronautics and the special assistant to the Bureau's chief. World War II began on September 1, 1939, when Nazi Germany invaded Poland without a formal declaration of war. In support of their mutual defense treaty obligations with Poland, France and Great Britain issued ultimatums to Hitler for the immediate withdrawal of German forces from Poland. When the ultimatum deadlines expired, Great Britain and France declared war on Germany on September 3, 1939. Within a month, Germany and their ally, the Soviet Union, conquered Poland and partitioned the Polish state. On April 9, 1940, Nazi forces invaded Norway and Denmark. Denmark surrendered that day. Norway held out until early June before German forces could occupy the entire country. On May 10, 1940, Nazi Germany began its assault on Western Europe by invading France and the neutral Low Countries, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. The Low Countries were under German occupation by the end of May. On June 22, 1940, France signed an armistice with Germany. The armistice provided for the German occupation of the northern half of France and permitted the establishment of a, collabor a collaborationist regime in the south with its seat in Vichy. To pave the way for an invasion of Britain, German planes bombed Britain extensively beginning in September 1940 until May 1941, known as the Blitz, including night raids on London and other industrial centers that caused heavy civilian casualties and damage. The British managed to hold off the Nazis, but with Britain's defensive resources pushed to the limit, Prime Minister Winston Churchill began receiving crucial aid from the United States under the Lend-Lease Act passed by Congress in early 1941. The Lend-Lease Act of 1941 stated that the U.S. government could lend or lease, rather than sell, war supplies to any nation deemed, quote, vital to the defense of the United States. Under this policy, the United States was able to supply military aid to its foreign allies during World War II, while still remaining officially neutral in the conflict. Unfortunately, America's isolation from the war ended on December 7, 1941, when Japan staged a surprise attack on American military installations in the Pacific. The most devastating strike came at Pearl Harbor, the Hawaiian naval base where much of the U.S. Pacific fleet was moored. In a two-hour attack, Japanese warplanes sank or damaged 18 warships and destroyed 164 aircraft. Over 2,400 servicemen and civilians lost their lives. Although stunned by the events of December 7th, Americans were now more determined than ever. On December 8, 1941, President Franklin D. Roosevelt spoke before a joint session of Congress. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America 
was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation and at the solicitation of Japan was still in conversation with its government and its emperor looking toward the maintenance of peace in the Pacific. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. In addition, American ships have been reported torpedoed on the high seas between San Francisco and Honolulu. President Roosevelt went on to ask Congress to declare war against Japan, a declaration that was granted with just one dissenting vote. Three days later, on December 11th, Germany and Italy, allied with Japan, declared war on the United States. Later that same day, the United States formally declared that a state of war existed with Germany and Italy. America was now drawn into a global war. In her first year of World War II, October 1942 to be exact, Joy was commissioned a lieutenant in the Women's Reserve of the U.S. Naval Reserve and advanced through the ranks to captain by 1948. The Women's Reserve of the U.S. Naval Reserve, better known as the WAVES, for women accepted for voluntary emergency service, was established on July 30, 1942, and during World War II, 23,000 WAVES served in the aviation field. Unlike the Yeoman F of World War I, WAVES entered the Naval Reserve as officers as well as enlisted, although the officers had no command authority except within the Women's Reserve. The Bureau of Aeronautics was the most highly receptive to WAVES and employed officers in the traditionally male fields of engineering, gunnery, radio and radar, aircraft navigation and air traffic control. This was in part due to Lieutenant Joy Bright Hancock's influence. On August 1, 1943, Lieutenant Joy Bright Hancock was present for the launching ceremonies of the USS Lewis Hancock, a Navy ship named in honor of Joy's second husband, Lieutenant Commander Lewis Hancock Jr. That day, Joy made history as the first wave officer to christen a U.S. combatant ship. After World War II, in February 1946, Joy was appointed Assistant Director of Women's Reserve Plans, and on July 26, 1946, Joy became the third and last director of the Waves, rose to the rank of captain in October 1948, and then became Assistant Chief of Naval Personnel for Women. Her promotion to captain after only six years of service was one of the fastest progressions to that rank in the Navy's history. She played a prominent role in persuading the services to abolish the women's reserves and enlist women in their regular ranks for good. Captain Hancock was one of eight women to be sworn into the regular Navy following the Women's Armed Service Integration Act of 1948, which she was instrumental in preparing for passage. This act legally permitted women to serve in the U.S. Armed Forces in a number of official capacities. Most importantly, the act allowed women to serve in all four branches of the military. The seven other officers sworn in with Captain Hancock were Lieutenant Commanders Winifred Quick Collins, Anne King, and Francis Willoughby, Lieutenant Ellen Ford and Doris Cranmore, and Lieutenants Junior Grade Doris Defenderer and Betty Ray Tennant. Captain Hancock received commendations for her service to the Bureau of Naval Aeronautics and the Chief of Naval Operations Air during World War II and for her assistance in expanding opportunities for females in the Navy. She retired from active duty in June 1953 and her job as Assistant Chief of Naval Personnel for Women and received the Legion of Merit for her years of service. In addition to the Legion of Merit, 
By the end of her military career, Captain Hancock had also earned the Navy Commendation Medal, the World War I Victory Medal, the American Campaign Medal, the World War II Victory Medal, and the National Defense Service Medal. The transition from active duty to civilian life did little to slow Joy's active pace. After selling her house and moving to the Virgin Islands, where she learned how to handle a tractor and a bulldozer to clear her land, Joy missed home and returned to Wildwood, New Jersey. While she had been living in the Virgin Islands, one friend who paid Joy a visit was Ralph Oste, now a Vice Admiral with the Navy, who she first met back in 1925 in Egypt. In August 1954, Joy married Vice Admiral Ralph Andrew Oste and then accompanied him on his last tour of duty as Commander, 6th Fleet, from 1955 to 1956. This last tour took the couple on a trip through Europe and the Mediterranean, but in the spring of 1956, Ralph grew ill and Joy flew with him to the Army Hospital in Germany. It was determined that Ralph needed surgery and so the couple returned to the United States where he was admitted into Bethesda Naval Hospital. A few months later, Ralph passed away on November 18, 1956 at the age of 59, and 58-year-old Joy was widowed for a third time. In May 1959, Joy attended, as a sponsor, an impressive ceremony held in Puerto Rico when Ofsti Field was dedicated to the memory of her husband, Vice Admiral Ralph A. Ofsti. In retirement, Joy lived in Washington, D.C. during the 1960s, then moved to Cape May Courthouse in New Jersey, near her hometown of Wildwood. Once back in New Jersey, Joy returned to family duties, managing the William H. Bright Real Estate and Insurance Company, and she helped her brother run the Wildwood Yacht Basin. She also served on advisory boards and gave many speeches to military and veterans groups. Joy returned to the D.C. area in 1971 to live at Vincent Hall Retirement Community in McLean, Virginia. The following year, Joy's memoir, Lady in the Navy, A Personal Reminiscence, was published by the U.S. Naval Institute Press. A personal account of the growth of the waves and of her other recollections, Joy's memoir is perhaps the best autobiographical study of women in the Navy and a major source of information for this episode. Captain Joy Bright Hancock, veteran of both the First and Second World Wars, third and last director of the Women's Reserve of the U.S. Naval Reserve, better known as the Waves, passed away on August 20, 1986, at the age of 88, at Bethesda Naval Hospital. She was buried with honors with her third husband, Vice Admiral Ralph A. Ofsti, at Arlington National Cemetery. Although Captain Hancock gave herself little credit for women's vast strides in the U.S. Navy, she never regarded herself as a reformer, her contributions speak otherwise. Her own work, from the First World War to the Second, offered the armed forces a lesson in the benefits of placing women in uniform. The Joy Bright Hancock Organization at the United States Naval Academy in Maryland continues to serve female midshipmen at the academy. Joy concluded her 1972 memoir with the following words, and we here at Hidden History felt it was a good way to conclude our episode about her life. I admit to great pride in having had the privilege of being one of the leaders of an outstanding group of women, the Waves. To them I shall always owe a debt of gratitude for they, by their performance, loyalty, and dedication, and their pride in service, made our accomplishments possible. Thank you for listening and I hope that you've learned something new today. Season 3 of Hidden History will explore the lives of veterans of the United States as well as veterans of foreign countries historically connected to our nation, such as Britain, France, and Spain. Many of their stories have been hidden in the pages of history and deserve to be told. Pictures, newspaper clippings, and links to external articles relating to a particular episode are available on our website, hiddenhistorypod.com. Thanks again for listening. I'm John Rodriguez, and until we meet again, this has been Hidden History, and I'll see through time.